Um, my name is Bob Glazer. I'm uh, the managing director and founder of Acceleration Partners. We work on profitable new customer acquisition programs for fast-growing e-commerce companies. Uh, we work with One King's Lane, Tiny Prints, Adidas, Shutterfly, uh, companies like that. We have a great panel here. Uh, we're missing one uh, panelist, Brian Littleton from ShareSale, who got stuck in the, in the snow in Denver. So I'm going to do my best to uh, impersonate him uh, right after, after myself. Uh, also joining us is, uh, and I'll let them introduce themselves when they come up, but Caitlin Watson from Cabbage, who heads up acquisition, and Adam Grinier, who heads up mobile for Hotel Tonight. So we have a great panel, and I think, you know, we've talked about this. There's a lot of, there's a lot of talk about attribution, um, and a lot of people trying to make it really complicated or thinking about all the difficult things. We really want to go through some specific examples that you can do across the different channels. So we'll talk about... Um, affiliate, search, mobile, multi-device, multi-channel, and give you some stuff that uh, you can walk away with. And like I said, we'll leave about 10 minutes for, for questions at the end. Apparently we have three more. All right, so, um, you know, last in is, has been the dominant model that's pervaded uh, attribution for the last 10 years. And I think when people started with Last In, the notion was there's a few channels in the marketplace and someone came in a month ago through channel Ch X and now they came in a week ago through channel Y. We want to reward the person closest to the customer. It seemed to make, it seemed to make a lot of sense. Um, but what happened is, and, and I think this has just been an exacerbator over the last three years, is that you've got uh, much more channels. You know, we'll, we'll go into maybe three, four, five in the marketplace. And you have these maybe all showing up in the same day sometimes or the same week before, um, before the purchase. So the time period's really changed. And I think people are, are, are struggling to figure out the value. And this last in notion in a world where people are trying to be last in is really distorting uh, who's delivering value in the, uh, in the advertising chain. There's, there's, there's a bunch of seats in the front corner up here. If, there, if there's one in like the middle, do you guys mind just like sliding over just so they can get to the edge? Yeah. So for those of you who've been in your, in your analytics, uh, following the click path is really important. So this notion of multi-touch attribution and what it looks like before a customer gets into a transaction, I think the numbers people are saying uh, in e-commerce is about 3.5 channels per transaction. And this is, this is what it looks like sometimes. You go from an email to a search to display, your affiliates jump in. And um, some channels, uh, one of the things, you know, no, some channels are always showing up at the end. Some channels are always showing up at the beginning. And there's, there's good reasons for that and there's bad reasons for that. So the double counting problem, there's two models that sort of pervade. I say it's the overweighting the last in or the counting everything model. So you have a lot of players on your team. You might be, half of these things might be in-house. They might be outsourced. You have an SEO guy, affiliate, PPC, uh, CRM, display, social media, and there's probably two or three more um, channels in there. So what happens is um, everyone comes at the end of the month to the report, and uh, this is my one plus one plus one plus one plus one equals two slide, and they say, hey, I did a million, and this guy says, I did a million, and every channel says, I did a million, because they're all placing markers in there, and when there's a sale, uh, everyone kind of raises their hand and says they got it. It's kind, of, it's kind of equivalent if you had a sales force that was calling on people, and one person booked the sale and everyone asked to be paid uh, their commission on it. So this happens a lot where all the groups come in, especially if it's not all done in one place, and the numbers just don't add up. Um, they're not counting all the, all the overlap in here. So really, this is what it looks like. If you look at that analytic stream before where it was sort of linear, this is how you look at, at the overlap and seeing this is what's really going on. And so when we're looking for you know, incrementality in a channel, let's say the affiliate channel, we'd really look at this outer piece. So where are affiliates who are being paid you know, a healthy percentage of revenue, where, where are they in there and where are they in there that other people aren't getting paid as well? And that's where we look where our affiliates are driving the most incremental revenue where they're not overlapping with the other channels. So how does this play out in search? Um, there's a lot of channels and people out there who are taking credit for your company's names. 
They're targeting people looking for your company's names. They're getting a lot of credit for the buyer, and it's just not, not a value-added activity. So how this plays itself out in search is, you know, it, when someone is out there looking for something, and I have, I have the non-branded, they say, oh, I'm out there looking for a photo book, and, or I'm looking for a consulting firm, and I find acceleration partners, and then I make my purchase. A lot of the channels and the advertising channels are the ones converting the person doing that search to the result of what they're looking for and to the company. Unfortunately, as you guys are probably very well aware of, there's a lot that have figured out that people are willing to pay for this last in. So they're working the other way around. Someone's out there looking for my company or my brand, and they're out there trying to get in front of that or get paid a lead or a commission for delivering the person who's actually looking for the brand. And a lot of this can be done by the companies at a much lower cost, and a lot of this gets attributed to channels where it's really not a function of a, a marketing or customer acquisition. It's a function of a recall and someone who already knew you. So, you know, dating myself here, I, I use my white pages, uh, yellow pages analogy. But, you know, the white pages, people used to pay 10 bucks to be in these things. You know, if you're looking for Shutterfly, it's not hard uh, to find Shutterfly. What's a lot more competitive and what's a lot more valuable is if you're looking for photo books and there's a lot of vendors and Shutterfly wants to be one of those vendors that's found. So when you're dealing with, um, you know, people talking about the organic search and the revenue, we see, we see this a lot. You know, a firm showing a huge increase in organic search, and the branded is a, is a huge part of the campaign, and they're almost getting no one to the site who didn't know the name of the vendor in the first place. Um, how that plays itself out in terms of, these are taken from an actual report that was sent to a client we worked with. So on the branded terms, again, bidding on a company's name, there's probably four or five terms. You can do this pennies on the dollar. They have 3,300 clicks. They've spent $2,200. They got $9,000 revenue. It's great. It's a 76% margin. Everything that they were bidding on that was non-branded, that required talent, they were actually losing money on. Um, and then they're sending over this average that looks like doing a great job on the, on the branded search campaign when most of the people that they were successful in sort of paying on a performance basis were people looking for the brand. They weren't looking for products that the brand sells. So I, I, if you, internally, if you work with PPC agencies and this isn't broken out, you really want to look at the breakdown. I think we find that you know, nine times out of ten, this data is obfuscated to show you a, a good average um, when the average really isn't telling the story. So attribution and affiliate. Affiliates, great channel, performance base, sounds great in theory. Affiliates are largely responsible for some of the poorest attribution uh, of sales out there in, in commerce. And they do that again by companies paying a high commission um, on this sort of last in referral and, and business models that try to be last in. So let's look at two different scenarios here. You have a company that's selling a commodity product, a toaster. I go out there looking for the Black & Decker Model 100 toaster. Um, there's shopping comparison sites, there's loyalty sites, there's cashback sites. I, I look around and I find someone who gives me the best deal and I don't have a lot of loyalty and they help drive me maybe through Coupon Cabin or to You Promise uh, to buy it from, from Target. And loyalty can add a lot of value um, in there and coupons can add a lot of value if, if it was a product-based search and they're helping to drive to a merchant. But if you're a high branded merchant, you're a single channel merchant, you have something that you, people know they want and trying to get to, this is where the affiliates start to cause a lot of problems. Um, when people talk about affiliate revenue, it, affiliate revenue is all revenue where the affiliates got a marker in the transaction. It doesn't mean that it's unique to affiliates or otherwise. So in this case, the customer you know, wants to buy a Tiffany ring. They know I want to buy a Tiffany ring. Um, they go and search for Tiffany. If they've downloaded uh, a toolbar, some sort of spyware, their kids did a, downloaded some games that have uh, spyware in it, and they try to actually go to Tiffany.com, these, these things will jump in front of the transaction, place their cookie, and take credit for it. So now that's, that's affiliate revenue, even though the person knew they wanted to buy from Tiffany and, and navigated directly to it. Similarly, there's a lot of business models that once their people are in the cart, they try to show them coupons, make up coupons. We all see that promo box and go looking for them. Understand when you click on a coupon or do something uh, or click on it and don't use it or click to view here, that sets a cookie. Affiliates now in these programs are getting credit for all of that revenue. Again, the person was already in your cart. So they're using 
forced click tactics, they're using cookie stuffing, they're making up offers. This is revenue that sort of shows up in a channel, but how did the person get to the cart? They went directly, they came from another paid source. Um, you know, it, 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 it's showing up in one place, but it's not really telling you where the customer came from, and you're likely really over overpaying that channel. So first in has problems, last in has problems. Um, you know, I think people are really moving towards the, the multi-channel model, and uh, I think a lot of people with us say, look, we really want to value the top of funnel people. Who's driving brand awareness? Who's writing about us? Who's doing stuff? The problem is all their models are paying the last in person. So this is how someone would look at maybe breaking up a $100 sale. They'd say, well, 50, you know, if there were three people in the channel, kind of 50% of that we're going to attribute to the person who introduced. There was some engagement along the way. We'll give these guys 25, and the closer will give 25. The closers now are often getting $100. The closers are, are always valued really at the, at the expense of others. And you talk to marketers and you talk to companies and they say, we love the top of funnel guys, but they're, but they're overpaying the bottle of funnel guys. So it just, it just doesn't line up. So how would this work in baseball? Um, I took a look at this because it's, it's such a hard concept to explain, and I went looking and I said, all right, who's, who's the highest paid closers last year? Well, it was uh, Jonathan Papelbon on the Phillies. He got an $11 million deal. How'd they do? They finished third place out of the playoffs. He actually had a good year. So it's interesting. The point wasn't that he wasn't bad. It's the Phillies were never in the position to win and, and need the closer. Um, the second highest player was Heath Bell on the, uh, on the Diamondbacks, and he, he was, uh, they finished in last place. So... The, the first place in the regular season was Tyler Clippard. He was paid pretty, pretty low on the average, and, and the guy who won the World Series was paid pretty low, Sergio Romo. So they were, you know, these, these are teams that aren't blowing all their money on the closer. They realize you've got to get to the ninth inning um, to have that, and I think, it, again, it's not that Heath Bell didn't pitch very well, but Pavlovon pitched well. They just, they just weren't in a position to win. So when you look at your funnel, you really got to figure out who's getting you to the end, and um, then who's helping you close and, and, and make sure there's a right price for, for everyone in there. So the Tiny Prince example, how, how do we run the Tiny Prince affiliate program differently? We use individual order-based attribution. We look at not an affiliate in whole, but we look at did they set a cookie in the last, it takes 30 minutes to customize the Tiny Prince product. Did they set a cookie in the last 30 seconds? Did they come in a long time ago? So we do, instead of making a general rule on affiliate, we do lowered commissions for affiliates that have high channel overlap, and we actually put in overwrite protection. So if a coupon affiliate uh, overwrites a content affiliate in the last 10 minutes of the order stream, we go back and give commission to the, uh, to the content affiliate. And that actually rewards the behavior we want and doesn't overpay the guy who's, who's, who's getting a lot of false credit. Um, we increase commissions who drive. We take the money we save by not overpaying the coupon guys and loyalty guys, and we give that to the front of funnel guys and pay them a lot more and try to get them to do the, the stuff that is on brand. And we don't allow toolbars in the program. Um, I think on a performance-based program, something that has no user intent on it is something that uh, if you guys ever work with toolbars, you should just make sure you understand them, download it as a user, go to your site and see how it works and see if you're comfortable with that, that in the user experience. Um, and what do we get? We get really high performance from, and loyalty from the content uh, affiliates that we want and the folks that we want to drive uh, top of funnel. So that, um, that's all I have for me. I will now uh, try to play Brian for a few minutes and, and dovetail off the end of this. Um, Brian is the head of uh, ShareSale and the founder of ShareSale, which is an affiliate network. And they've put a lot of time and effort into rolling out attribution to let merchants and advertisers control how they want to pay people and where they want to pay them in the transaction. And this is really not being done as much as it, it should, and they're leading this. So there's some examples here of um, that dovetail well with what I was showing you how, how you would do this. So in attribution, there's three pieces. Um, you got to identify and segment your population and know who's doing what and take a look at that. You got to develop scenarios. Um, I think, as, as I know Caitlin's going to talk about this, but there's no magic bullet. You don't crunch all these numbers and it comes out and says what it is. You got to look at different scenarios, different players, and try to use the technology to figure out what's going on and who you want to reward. And then again, when you develop your scenarios and your rules, the technology will help you automate those rules. So. In affiliate, here's an example of a couple scenarios. You have coupon affiliates who are typically 
um, you know, low to click sales time, they're right at the end of the, of the cart and the funnel. You have PPC affiliates who are high conversion and kind of ramp up, ramp up quickly and drive a lot of volume. And then you have these content guys who are very good with new customers, but they're slower, smaller ramp, and they tend to be at the front of the funnel. So these are the segments, and these are actually tags that the ShareSub platform would let you attribute to your different, um, to your different people. Um, you could put conference management tags. I met them at Affiliate Summit West. You could do performance management tags. They were in our top, they were in our top 10. They're VIP. They're people we want. Promotional methods by how they're actually promoting violations. You know, have they broken your rules once or twice? There are a lot of bonus campaigns out there that go to people who have broken rules continuously versus thinking about excluding, excluding them. And then stores, if you have a multi-store e-commerce, um, are they a participant in one store or more stores? So you define your segments, and then you think about your scenario. So the, the coupon one comes up a lot. And um, the clickstream data is all there in the network. And you can look at when people come in and choose how to change your payout um, based on that behavior. So we'll look at uh, actual data sort of from the share sell system and look how a typical content and coupon sites would show up in a transaction. So the common scenario that we set and a lot of people do is they say this group of affiliates like coupon sites is, is setting um, clicks within three minutes of order. The problem is our average order time is about you know 10 minutes. So they seem to be getting people who are already in the cart. Uh, so what do, we, what do we do about that or what does that look like? So here's the actual transaction data from the multi-affiliates in the network. So this mommy blogger drove someone to the site, um, and then all of a sudden um, there were a couple of different um, coupon sites who came in at the end. Presumably they drew them to the brand, they went there, popped off the box, looked around, trying to find the best offer, clicked on one site, clicked on another. So now you have three and four affiliates showing up um, in this transaction, and then the transaction is the, is the blue dot. So in, in one um, scenario, you can, sorry, I think that might be the, the next slide. So in one scenario, you can create that, that leapfrog effect. You can say, you know what? People tagged as coupon, if they are in the end of the funnel, what I've defined as in the end, and there's two affiliates, then I want to basically go back to the first affiliate. And you can have a different scenario that says, you know what? If there's two coupon affiliates in there and no content affiliate, use the last guy in because he was the closest one to the sale. And you can also set another rule that says, hey, if there's a coupon affiliate in the last in two minutes, I want to pay a different rate than if he was in, you know, 10 minutes more or more before the, before the funnel. So there's sort of the contiguous clicks of collecting all these points and data and then figuring out um, how you want to use it. So in, in the network, and here's an example, you take this rule and you'd start adding conditions. So this click must be less than or equal to three minute, and then if not, use the oldest contiguous click, um, and you know, pay this person a half of a share. And then here's the other leapfrog transaction scenario where you take all those points and define when you're gonna use sort of a linear payout, or you're gonna go back to the, back to the first person. And then big sale, you know, a lot of vendors come in and say, hey, but I drive, you know, I drive new customers or I drive huge sales. Um, I, even if I'm late, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't want to be subject to that. So you say, oh, that's great. Well, all the average transaction data for the last 30 or 90 days is in the network. So again, in this case, you can set up a dynamic rule and put a fixed dollar amount or say if the average commission's 25% or if the average sale is 25% or more above what we normally pay, uh, what it's been for the last 30 days, pay that person the higher rate. So now at least if the coupon guys are coming in and they're doing what they said they're going to do and raise the order value, you're making sure that you know, you're only paying them on the, on the highest value transactions. And, and this is really new stuff in the affiliate space. It just hasn't existed and it's being done for the first time in the last, in the last six months. And again, it's not talked a lot about coupons, but it's not all about that. So as an advertiser, you want to define what's valuable to you. So you know, you could add a bonus from a certain recruiting source, uh, certain banners that you want to promote, certain types of campaigns, and, and, and make those banners have a higher performance level. Um, you could throw in a fat, flat uh, $50 for a sale that was over 500. You can double down on new customer commissions um, for, for if you're flagging that it's a new customer. 
And um, again, this is, this is a good one. We deal with this a lot. There are coupon sites that are doing things that are not valuable, and then sometimes they're doing things that are valuable. So you could lock in a regular commission rule for them and override these other rules if they use certain creatives that you did. Because now the person's coming through a banner, and they're, not, and they're being driven in the front. They're not coming through the kind of click to activate button. So all, all kinds of stuff that, that you can play around with. And again, this is why it's, it's defining the scenarios. It's defining what you want as a company. There are companies that just want new customers and volume. There are companies that want higher, higher order value. And this, this goes into the whole attribution funnel in terms of thinking what behavior it is that you want to, that you want to incentivize and, and tying the payouts to that. So with all this stuff, you would have created a modern affiliate program. Um, the nice thing about it is it uses real data to determine pretty complex commission structures. Um, you don't have to get away from blanket decisions of I'm going to pay this guy X or Y. You can make smarter decisions about the order quality. As I said it before, it's, you can incentivize the behavior that you want, which is, I think, sorely missing uh, from the whole attribution discussion in terms of, again, if you want top of funnel, then stop overpaying back of the funnel. Um, if you want back of funnel, you know, there's plenty of, then you're not going to want to pay the front of funnel people. And, uh, you know, this takes a lot of technology. Um, one size doesn't fit all. But it takes the human element, too. And I think you'll hear about this from the other speakers. Um, this technology just helps. But you got to go under the hood and look and think and define what you want and then use the technology to help support that. Um, it's never going to spit out a perfect answer. It's attributions. It's, it's a messy thing that's a, it's kind of an ongoing uh, organism that uh, that is always changing. All right, Caitlin. So I'm excited to see so many people here trying to get that magic answer on attribution, um, but unfortunately I don't have it. Um, however, I will give you some real life examples from two brands that I have worked with. Um, currently heading up acquisition marketing for a uh, a new company which has been in business for a little under two years, but. Um, in less than two years has, um, is, is already the largest um, source of funding online for small businesses. And then also we'll tell you a little bit about how um, very high level um, what attribution looks like at Shutterfly as well. And um, you know, while we talk about the, with Bob, the affiliate channel, oops, the affiliate channel, the reality is, um, as he mentioned, the, the, the funnel, there really isn't the traditional funnel in the way that we have always looked at it in the past. And I don't know if the guys from Convertro are in the room. I actually stole this slide from them. They came in to talk to me at Cabbage, and I thought it was so great. So I was like, I want to add that to my presentation. But um, the reality is this is the funnel. And um, what, what we have um, within Cabbage and within Shutterfly is multiple attribution models within each area of the funnel. So we, act, we have an attribution model within affiliates, within search, within display, and then that all ladders up into the larger company attribution model, which is what I'm going to talk to you about today. So um, starting with Shutterfly and just very high level um, what we really agreed to do, and that's really half the battle, is just getting the uh, stakeholders from the company involved, getting everyone to agree on something. And once you agree on that methodology, making sure that you use it for a long enough period to really see a trend, because that's where you're going to get the um, most of the benefit and the impact from attribution is coming to that agreement, looking at it over time, because that's where you'll really see the ups, the downs, the ebbs, and the flows of your media. So what we did when we agreed on a strategy is it was really a, a hierarchical strategy. So um, we essentially said anything that is... Uh, where a customer has to take a very specific action and type in a code on Shutterfly.com. And of course, it's an e-commerce business, so um, if you are you know, a retailer with brick and mortar stores, this might not be as simple, but um, had the benefit of working for an e-commerce business. So we said um, direct mail, partner programs, television, anything that has that customer takes something in their hand, they go to the site and they type in a unique code we're going to give them credit, even though we know that a lot of those people will come later in the funnel and they'll convert through brand search or display retargeting. We're, we're giving the credit to that top of funnel. Then we said everything in the middle, um, brand search, uh, non-brand search, affiliate display, um, is going to be last click, last view. But what's different about this than what a lot of brands are doing is we were actually able to 
pull in that view element for display. And this is really important because um, you know, everyone has that direct bucket for all those conversions that, oh, those people just show up at your website and nobody really knows how that happens, right? Um, well, what we were able to do was, um, and this is critical when thinking about the tools, is we use MediaPlex, and you can do this with any ad server, and set up a, a, a real-time data feed from MediaPlex back to Shutterfly that essentially um, had a cookie ID for every single user who converted on Shutterfly.com. Of course, we weren't able to see internally if those people had seen an impression or not, but that's what that data feed enabled us to do. So what we did is we said, okay, Looking at that hierarchy that we set up, we have all of our people who they typed in a code, then we have everyone in the mid funnel, um, and then we have all the bottom of funnel, view through, retargeting, um, brand search. What we would do is if there was someone who came in directly to the site, we match that cookie ID to whether they saw an impression and if they saw an impression, we gave that credit to view through. So as an, as an online marketer, I led the internet marketing team at Shutterfly. I loved that. I was finally getting credit for view through and not just credit within my department, but credit across the entire company. Um, and so then of course, within affiliate, we had our own attribution model. Within um, online media, including display and search, we had our own attribution model, but it all laddered up into the larger model and um, we were definitely not able to do it ourselves within our team. So um, in order to do something like this, uh, especially to bring the view through into your internal data, um, you have to have an ad server. It's almost impossible without that. You also have to have a team that, um, from an analytics perspective, is willing to help, willing to learn, um, and really build the model for you so that um, when all of the conversions are coming in, they have some sort of methodology to tack each conversion back to a channel, whether it's a direct click or a view. Um, and then of course a business analyst, which is best suited to have on your direct team. Um, and then of course QA. So when we, um, the, the story of Shutterfly is, uh, I was there for four years, we uh, worked with a large agency, we pulled everything in house and decided we wanted to be our own internal agency. Um, we worked directly with Bob as well. And we had a lot of success with that, but the one thing that you do lose going in-house is someone sitting there QAing, following the footsteps to make sure that everything is perfect, and especially in reporting and attribution, you need that. And so um, that's a, a person that I recommend to, to bring on. Um, and then from there, it's, it's really a, all about how are you using this day to day. Um, I mentioned the trend building. So whatever reports you come up with based on all of this attribution, um, you need to make sure that you're not just looking at the channels in a silo, but really understanding how the trends work. And if a trend changes, then looking back at all the channels and figuring out, okay, what did we do this week? Did we send a direct mail? Did we ramp up in search or whatever it is? Um, and then also, you know, everyone thinks there's this kind of holy grail, there's this one magic funnel and attribution model. Well, when you look at a, a model within a model, which is kind of what I'm um, alluding to, there are also models for different types of conversion. So we actually had a different attribution model for someone who initiated a project on Shutterfly versus someone who came in, maybe they had their photo book sitting in their account, they came in to, um, to finalize and pay for that project. Um, and, and that brought a lot of really interesting insights because the outcome for the initiation, um, and it would be the same with acquisition versus retention um, and those conversions as well. Um, and then building attribution into the CPAs and into the forecast. So everyone says, okay, you have, you have this funnel, you have all these um, things that are happening at the bottom like brand search and um, view through. And what we saw when we actually pulled the view through into um, our internal database is that our MediaPlex view through numbers would match um, our internal numbers by about 70 to 90 percent, just give or take, what, depending on what was going on. Um, but what we did at the beginning of each quarter is we built that into our forecasting. So you also need to make sure that when you're forecasting and when you're looking at the numbers, you're looking at it based on the agreed to set up model and not in the silo of the, just the channel. Um, so moving on to Cabbage, I've been in Cabbage about six months. Um, like I said, the company launched a little under two years ago, but we are really taking the small business finance world by storm. Um, there, there's really no one doing what we're doing, which is using 
uh, small business real-time data in order to make a credit decision on uh, how much money we can give to a small business. And the whole process happens in seven minutes. So um, I love it because my background is in direct response marketing. Um, and so thinking of a, a finance model that's this unique that allows small businesses to have cash in their hand in seven minutes um, is, is pretty is pretty amazing. So um, going from the you know 1,000 person public company to the 100 person you know stealth crazy growth mode um, smaller company and uh, them approaching me and saying well we need you to set all this up from scratch the uh, the bad news is is nothing's been done the good news is that nothing's been done so so I took on that challenge and uh, you know you don't have the beauty of having all the tools and the big teams and the ad server and all these great things. Um, but the good thing is that th there are less channels, you know, the brand is not uh, super well known yet, but, it, but that's changing. So we did a um, similar model, very rule based. We did first click and last click attribution because right now we quite frankly don't have a lot of view through to focus on. So um, this one, two, three step process is really the, this is the cabbage process. If you're a small business, you come to the site, you sign up, you give us a username and password, you, um, <coughs> connect through whatever data sources you have. Like for example, um, eBay is one of those data sources if you're an eBay seller. If you take PayPal, PayPal is a data source, QuickBooks, and so on and so forth. Um, so you connect those channels and then you, uh, you take cash. And at that point where you get approved, um, that is what we consider a qualified customer conversion. So let's just say that um, there's two channels in the transaction. There's the sign up. Um, maybe someone came in through, uh, let's just say, an ad targeted on eBay to sellers. And then the second channel, which is them actually becoming a qualified customer for Cabbage, um, they come in through branded SEM. Um, the way that we put our model together is we said we are going to give credit to that first channel. And, you know, th this might not be the long-term solution, but again, the most important thing is to agree across the organization how you're going to look at things, put the model, put the stake in the ground together, and base your reporting on that. So how would this work just in another example, um, just to show how this could work? So maybe someone comes to the site directly on their own. Maybe they just heard about Cabbage through word of mouth or a press release. Um, and then the ch second channel is branded SEM. In that case, we've set up the rule where branded SEM will take the credit. And, um, you know, it... The majority of the time, that's because um, the paid we, we want to attribute it to the paid channel where the paid channel was the initiator. So just overall tips. Um, there is no perfect answer, but it is an evolution. It will get better. So um, if you're going to a new company or you're going to a company that's been around a long time, start with something and know that you, know, you can completely change it six months to a year from now, but start with something. Um, no matter what you do, get everyone's buy-in so that uh, we've, all, we've all gone in those meetings where, like in the example that I just showed you, you said, yeah, well, we gave the credit back to the first thing, and then someone said, no, I don't think that's the right, you know, I don't think that's the answer. Well, it doesn't matter. Just agree on something and get everyone's buy-in. Um, it will never be perfect or right. Um, and what, like I said, whatever you agree to, stick with it, and that trends don't lie. So <laughs> even if it isn't the perfect attribution model that you vision, that you have in your vision, um, the, the, the trends will not lie. If you see something changing that has been on a specific trend and it, it's, it goes up or it goes down, there's always something that you can kind of go back to and, and figure out what's going on. Um, and then the other thing is, is going back to, you guys saw the Shutterfly funnel, um, start with a customer cycle and go from there. Think about how do customers find you? How do they get to your site? Where do they start? Where are they, what channel are they most likely to take action from? Um, so just look at the life cycle, start from there. And that's, that's how I've done it. Um, previous to Shutterfly, I was at La Quinta Hotels and we did the same thing and, um, it, and it's worked. So um, I'll be happy to answer questions at the end. And next we've got Adam from Hotel Tonight, which is an amazing app. Everyone should download it. Thank you. Um, can I get a quick show of hands of how many of you are actively doing some type of mobile marketing right now? All right. So obviously, it's already you know picked up a lot of steam. And if you've you know walked the trade floor at all today or been and seen any of the other presentations anywhere, um, mobile is just coming up more and more and more. Um, and obviously, it's a huge consumer trend, and people are picking it up 
and taking it off with it. So, of course, the advertisers are going to follow where the consumers are going. Uh, and unfortunately, a lot of traditional advertisers, and calling digital uh, advertising traditional, um, are obviously wanting to get into that marketplace. And so they have these assumptions that getting into mobile marketing is going to be exactly like what it is with digital. It's, it's actually a, an evolved medium, so you would assume that the attribution and tracking and ad model in the mobile space would also be an evolution of what we saw with digital advertising. Unfortunately, that's just simply not the case. Um, so I'm at Hotel Tonight. We're a same-day mobile application for booking hotels. Uh, if you haven't tried it out, uh, please definitely download it um, and give it a shot. But uh, for the last two years, we've been around and we've been driving you know, unique users across the board to download our application and eventually, ho hopefully, book a hotel in the same evening. Um, so I just kind of want to share some of the learnings that I've got from the market, from Hotel Tonight, as well as my previous experiences. Um, so that you can you know, get a feel for what are some of the unique challenges when it comes to attribution within the mobile space. Uh, so first, what really makes mobile attribution different? Uh, the big and I think kind of key driving factor of what really sets it apart from all the other channels that we've been hearing about today is that there's just simply no true ad serving platforms that exist. Uh, what this means is that the, the traditional use of cookies to track if somebody has clicked an ad or seen an offer or viewed something and then had some type of down funnel action just simply doesn't exist when it comes to applications. There's a variety of different things that I'll get into of, of why that's the case, of why cookies don't really work the same way in mobile that they do in online advertising. Um, but that inevitably, you know, it, it kind of puts a big hole in the middle of most of the models that have been built and worked together for most of the companies in the industry uh, over the last 10, 15 years. Suddenly you don't have the cookie, you feel lost, you feel kind of scared, you don't really know, okay, what money am I spending and, and what's it actually doing? Um, and what that also means is that impression and frequency control are kind of out the window as well. So it's literally like d taking a wild, wild west approach to marketing. Uh, for the last you know, 10 years, we've been focused on, okay, if somebody sees my ad and how often do they see it, do they actually take an action? Now, all of a sudden in the mobile ecosystem, to be able to do that actually effectively is, is almost impossible because the types of ad serving that do exist on the publisher side are, are really uh, different across the board. And then for the advertiser side, they really just don't exist at this point. And then when it comes to last click and first click, right now those are really the only two options when it comes to mobile attribution. Uh, you'll have partners that you could work with that will insist on if they were the last click that you tracked, uh, then indeed they should get the credit for, um, for a download or for a, a down funnel action or some type of mobile interaction that the user might have taken. But actually, in the mobile space, what's been interesting to see is that first click, I think, has gotten a lot more credit, um, and understandably so because of the pace that the consumer works. So oftentimes, people are optimizing a campaign based on, did somebody actually download my application? And unfortunately, because of the lack of frequency control, uh, people are seeing tons of ads in a very short amount of time. There's also an interesting challenge of accidental clicks happen really high frequency in the mobile space. And so when you give the last click, uh, often the last click might be the 10th click that you tracked for an action that might have happened in literally a minutes, you know, a couple minutes time frame. And so all of a sudden, you know, the, the value of the last click is, it's, it seems more like, oh, that was just a chance that you happened to get a click. So it's more reliable to say, well, likely the, uh, any, uh, understanding of my company to this consumer actually came from the first ad that they saw and they actually clicked and they interacted with. Um, and so that whole idea of understanding what are the variety of clicks that happen over the course of time, when you look at that time frame as a really small condensed period of time, then all of a sudden the idea of a last click versus a first click take a completely different, de different definition than what we would use in the online space. Um, so as I mentioned before, there's, you know, with, without cookie tracking, um, it, it makes a lot of extra fun challenges for the mobile space. Um, and so the reason that, that it doesn't really work the same way, uh, there's a few key pieces. Uh, so first is use various different tech standards. So when you interact with somebody in an online environment, typically they're spending all of their actual user experience in one confined space, and that's typically a user's browser, right? So maybe they use Chrome, maybe they use Firefox, Internet Explorer. They're rarely jumping between different types of browsers. So a cookie can be easily persistent among everything that they do because it's got one kind of place to store that cookie and that information. 
But with mobile, a user actually jumps between actual platforms within one device regularly throughout the day. So every app that they may enter is actually its own unique individual platform that doesn't necessarily speak or the same language or have the same storage space as other applications. You add in ad additional challenges to that, as, such as internet, uh, mobile internet browsing uh, is another different platform than a mobile web or app uh, experience. Um, and then you have things like SMS. And so being able to track an interaction of an ad or an experience across those different platforms, you keep getting cut off. Uh, you can't actually track the user very effectively from one to the next. So that again just adds additional challenges that we don't see typically in the online space. Uh, the next big you know, challenge that the industry faces is, is a new level of privacy concerns. Uh, so anybody that's been in the industry for a while knows that anytime you speak with anybody outside of the ad industry and you bring up cookies, they shudder and they get, oh my god, you're tapping into everything that I know and that I do. Take that and multiply it by 10,000 because now you're actually interacting with a person's wallet. You're not just interacting with the game that they're playing or the email that they're checking, but you're actually interacting with everything that they find near and dear to themselves. And so when it comes to tracking people, you've got people like Apple and like Google and the big players and Facebook in the space who are very, very cautious to open up tracking and open up different models and means to actually understand what these users are doing because it starts to step on people's um, concerns a lot quicker than it maybe already did in the online space. Um, and then finally, the, the solutions that have come into the market that really allow you to do kind of cross-platform, um, they're really great, they're really interesting. So QR codes, Shazam has had a lot of success lately by putting the, a Shazam um, app call into, a, um, into like a TV commercial so you could pull up your Shazam app and if you're listening to the commercial, it'll open up the website that you need to go to, et cetera. Those are all really great and really interesting from an ad tech perspective. But from a user, there's a huge challenge of actually expecting somebody to adapt that technology for the sole purpose of advertising. Uh, we'd all love for them to do it, right? But a lot of people, it's not intuitive to take your phone out and scan a barcode. And so inevitably, relying on those for your means of traffic, you're just losing out on a, a huge amount of people that may actually have a brand or a a DR impact from your ads that you're just not tracking because you're relying on a form of tracking that is simply not going to be used by majority, if, uh, if any at all, of the potential customers you could be working with. So what does that leave us with? So right now there's a handful of different tracking options that are in the marketplace. Uh, so the first and probably the most popular over the last couple of years has been ID-based tracking. And so what this is is an identifier that exists on a user's phone that is, is actually persistent in the entire user experience. Uh, so the, the most well-known one is a UDID, uh, which is what Apple uses. Uh, IMEI and Android ID are the, uh, are the Google uh, primary kind of uh, device IDs that they use. Um, but now there are newer options in the market, such as IDFA, which is iOS's new tracking parameter that uh, is essentially addresses that privacy concern I had previously discussed, which is it kind of separates the user from any of the actual data or device information that it might have, but still provides some type of persistent parameter that when a user clicks an ad, and then when they open an app or land on a mobile web page, you have something that is there on both ends of that spectrum so that you can match them. Um, so again, understanding that and understanding the concerns about first and last click, you can start to understand why there's so much kind of confusion in the space as far as how to effectively do this. Um, because of all the confusion and, and all the uncertainty around uh, device ID tracking and those privacy concerns, um, one of the newer tracking models that's become popular in the last uh, about year, really, is fingerprint tracking. Uh, and so this is, there's a, a couple of companies, uh, mo mobile app tracking, a company called Has Offers uh, has, and then Kochava are probably the two most well-known. Um, these are technologies that when a user clicks an ad, they capture a variety of different pieces of information that are non-personal identifying. So an IP address, the operating system that you're using, um, the clock speed of your phone, a variety of these different parameters that they do have access that don't touch any of that personal stuff and they capture that. And then when they open an application or they take the action that you're tracking on the back end, they then capture all of that same information again. And the reason it's called finger fingerprint tracking is because it doesn't all have to match. They have a ton of different parameters and as long as say 90% each has their own variable. 
Uh, if 90% of them match, they assume, okay, well, this is probably the exact same person. Um, and so the, the benefits of using a, a tracking model like this are that you, you do get a lot more transparency between those different platforms that exist within one device. Um, and so you can actually c capture that fingerprint, whether it's mobile web or an app or an SMS experience, whereas some of those ID-based tracking, you can only actually capture in you know, one type of experience. Um, Another model that is in, in the market right now is, is kind of cookie in quotation marks. Um, and so this is using like your copy and paste storage. Um, and Adex and Blue Kava are probably the most popular in this space. It can be a little bit more reliable than the fingerprint tracking, um, though there, there is a little bit of controversy in the market right now as far as um, how the, the kind of the bigger players in the space feel about that technology. Um, and then finally, there's direct partner integrations. So uh, Facebook, using if you have their SDK installed on your application or uh, within your user experience, they actually have some ability for you to track um, you know, things coming from Facebook and potentially outside of Facebook as well. Google, um, and then some of the bigger ad partners in the space, so Fixu and M.M, both have their own proprietary tracking that tend to be a mixture of, of those above three that I outlined. Um, so just a couple quick tips. Um, so first is ride the rate of change. So this was a um, just a quick snapshot of what the mobile marketplace looked like. Um, it was interactive, put this together. And these are just a lot of the different players in the space as far as ad networks and demand side platforms and ad tracking solutions and ad serving solutions, uh, direct publishers, et cetera. Um, and this is probably a year old. And I would say if it were re replicated today, it would take up the entire wall because <laughs> there's mobile companies coming out of the woodwork every single day. Um, and while there's some really great players in this space, mobile's evolving so quickly um, that it, you, you're just missing out if you're not at least exploring what the new partners that come into the space can offer you uh, because new, you know, new technologies and new discoveries are happening in the space that can actually you know, improve the process. Uh, so essentially don't just you know, find one partner, be happy with them, and work with them for the next 10 years for mobile, because uh, there's a good chance you'd be missing out on some other potential good opportunities to track and attribute your uh, ad spend. Um, number two, test, test, and test again. Um, so even the partners that I've worked with, I continuously test to make sure that it's accurate. Um, Caitlin kind of mentioned, you know, don't, don't feel like you're stuck on one thing. Um, with all these new players coming into the market, if you're not testing new partners, whether that's ad partners or attribution partners, um, again, you, you could potentially be missing out on really cool, good new opportunities to track and attribute your traffic. And then number three is to diversify your case study. Um, a lot of people in the space have a bad habit um, of just focusing on what other people in their exact industry are doing. So if you're a travel company, you just look at what other travel companies are doing with mobile and with online. If you're a gaming company, you just look at what gaming companies are doing. But right now, the mobile space is it's very different than your online space. So the biggest spenders in the space tend to be the, the mobile gaming companies. Um, but then you've got some traditional companies like Starbucks that are doing some really awesome stuff with mobile and have been for going on five, six years now. And then you've got companies like TuneIn who's doing a lot of like out-of-home advertising right now. And so actually looking, at, if you wait for people in your own competitive set to do something cool and use that as a case study, again, you're going to be behind the, the eight ball. So uh, I just encourage you to you know, be aware of what everybody's doing in the marketplace because um, you can uh, often learn some interesting, uh, just n new and cool things that are happening by looking at you know, other people that might be power players within the marketplace outside of your existing competitive set. Um, so finally, I just want to touch really quickly on, you know, because of all of these, you know, challenges that exist in the mobile advertising space and attribution, um, how do you actually measure your return on investment effectively? Um, so I think there's a couple key things, uh, you know, obviously, like, I could spend another couple hours talking about return on investment and how to track it, but just a couple real quick pieces as my time runs out. Um, so first, understand your short-term versus your lifetime value. Um, so a lot of people have a bad habit of saying, like, okay, well, the single purchase or the first purchase that I get from a user, that's what I should be paying out on um, when I'm working with affiliates, when I'm working with uh, performance partners. Um, but to understand, especially in the mobile space, um, the time frame that the first action might actually hap happen in uh, can be very, very short for many companies. 
or might not exist for a really long time. Um, so we have the situation where we have a lot of people that might download, a lot of you might download the mobile, the Hotel Tonight application today, but you've already got a hotel this evening, so you may not actually use it today, but you might not use it for another you know, couple of months. So understanding what the return that I'm getting just by you downloading the application or interacting with the application today in the first couple of hours can actually provide a lot of insight of what type of return I'm going to get long term. And so because the, the space is... Uh, is changing so rapidly, it's just wildly important for you to understand uh, and optimize off of a short-term return, short -term, term return um, versus always focusing just simply on the collective lifetime value that might, you might get from a user. Um, and as I just kind of mentioned, uh, understanding what your early indicators are. Um, so for a lot of people, it's maybe opening an application three times. Once the users open the application three times, the chance of them ever, you know, returning that investment for you goes up significantly. So really, you know, focusing in on what those key indicators are for your business and making that what you're optimizing your mobile spend off of, uh, which I would say 99.9% .9 of mobile companies, that early indicator is not an install. Uh, despite what any salesperson is going to tell you, uh, focusing on install is, is a very short-term game. And you'll understand if you look at anybody that was in the top of the App Store a year ago, um, a lot of them you can't even find in the App Store today. Um, and then finally, calculating organic lift value is something also really unique to ROI calculation when you look at mobile. Um, because... Again, because you're not always able to track anything that, you know, like organic stuff and search stuff and uh, people that are finding you in features on the App Store are oftentimes, it's really hard to actually attribute back to that. Um, so taking some time to actually understand what maybe your rank in the App Store, the impact that that has on your organic uh, the volume that your users are actually uh, downloading your application is really important to understand so that you can, again, properly calculate what that lifetime value might be and put the proper investment towards, uh, towards the ads that you're buying. Uh, I think that is everything from me.